Good afternoon. I understand that uh, we have visitor. Uh, I think we have uh, Winnie and uh, Yara. Am I correct? Yeah, we, we welcome you. How are you guys today? Is the uh, weather uh, good for you? Yeah, I was hoping that uh, today will be a very cool day. Yeah, because I have to put on the jacket. Eh? Okay, uh, before I minister the word of God uh, for today, now let me ask you a question. In your life, uh, do you have someone nagging at you to do something for your own good? Do you appreciate such nagger? Don't have, huh? okay. I often hear parents complain that children hate nagging, right, uh, young people? And it is frustrating uh, being parents. But I want to say to parents, uh, don't be discouraged. Uh. I urge you to continue to do the duty you are called as parents, right, to do. Or else, they may never know for sure what is good for them and be thankful. You know, my daughter, when she received uh, her JC result, she wrote a card to thank my wife for nagging her to study. I know young people are now uh, having exam, right? Don't know whether, and I'm sure their parents nag at you. Tomorrow exam, I study tonight. She, because she realized that her mother loves her and do not want her to waste her life away. Now, in First John, that we have studied, or the five chapter, the apostle is like a loving mother, wanting very much to see the, the people in the church know what is true Christianity, and not be misled by false teaching, and miss out the great blessings of salvation offered by God in and through Christ. Remember John, the Apostle John recorded the words of Jesus Christ in, first, in John chapter 3, verse 16. Some of us can actually re, uh, remember uh, this verse by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. These words in John 3, 16 tells us that the character of God is love. And he loves the world he created. Even after the world has fallen under the curse of sin, out of his great love, God unconditionally sacrificed his son Jesus Christ on the cross as a payment for sins so that whoever put their faith in him, in Jesus Christ, will be saved. This is indeed a grand salvation plan with great and eternal blessing. So how great would be the ways of God's grace if the people in the church fail to understand the gospel and led astray by the false teachers and false Christ in those days? So we see here in 1 John, the apostle takes great pain to explain what is true and what is false Christianity so that we can use it to examine our faith and know for certain that we are indeed a true Christian living in Christ. Now let's re recap the outline of uh, 1 John. Congratulations. We have come to the last four verses. You see, in the 10 sermon preached in the past weeks, we see Apostle John thoroughly presented the evidence of true Christianity. Contrast them with what is false in, ma in matters of obedience, love, and truth. You can see it on the screen. And then he tells us that the essence of true Christianity, listen, the essence of true Christianity is 
is love. And it is anchored on faith alone. Last Sunday, we learned that in practicing true Christianity, we will have confidence in our prayer life. We are given the privilege of prayer as God's children. Prayer has the power to strengthen the loving relationship vertically as well as horizontally. Now, as we study this last chapter in 1 John, we also read, we also read uh, in chapter 5, verse 13, where John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, in the last four verses, verses 18 to 21, John says three things in verse 18, 19, and 20. We know, we know, and we know. Notice, he changed. You may know to we know. What does it mean? It indicates that this is the conclusion of the whole matter. After all the compare and contrast, we should know for certain or we should be assured of the three things about true Christianity. And in the last verse, verse 21, John says, Little children, keep yourself from idols. Very much like a loving mother, after telling the children many things, many times over what they must do and what they must not do at home. And then as, he, as she is about to leave the house, she turned around and delivered her final words. Children, remember, don't open the door for a stranger. Okay? Hoping that the children will take heed of her important advice. So I hope that after this sermon, we, we will all take heed of John's advice and be thankful for his labor of love. So here we have the three certainties as given in the sermon outline. The first certainty is that Christ has set us apart to obey him instead of obeying sin. The second is that Christ has set us apart to love God, not to love the world. And the third is that Christ has set us apart to know and to worship the true and living God. Now, before we dive into the text, let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for all the precious lessons we have learned from the book of 1 John thus far. As we come to the concluding passage today, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our minds and cause us to have a right understanding of the gospel and be assured of our salvation in Christ. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Please keep your Bible open and let these four final verses you know, the final words are always very important to sink into our hearts and mind. Now, let us look at the first certainty in verse 18. John says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects himself. And the evil ones does not touch him. John mentions three things about sin in the life of a true Christian. He say a true Christian does not keep on sinning. True Christian protect himself from sin and the devil and the evil one cannot touch him. Now, why a true Christian does not keep on sinning? We know that in truth, Christ did not, listen carefully, Christ did not come to make sinners a perfect person, but a God's servant. John is saying that a true Christian will still fall into sin until he goes to heaven. But on this side of heaven, he will not sin, listen carefully, 
he will not sin persistently or wholeheartedly. You get what I mean? A true Christian will have the Holy Spirit dwell in him and his heart and mind are renewed. Paul called it a new creature. Sin will make him uncomfortable because he knows that it was his sin that caused the death of Jesus Christ. And it was the blood of Jesus that removed the curse of sin. So when he sins, he knows that it is unacceptable to God. A sin offends God and displeases him. So dearly beloved, I'm sure you struggle with sins every day. But take heart. John also says that true Christian can protect himself and Satan cannot touch him. Remember what John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and also chapter 2, verse 1. The Apostle John has told us that Jesus is our antidote and defense lawyer. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then in chapter 2, verse 1, my little children, I'm writing this thing to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, a defense lawyer with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So in truth, we know that a true Christian has a regenerated heart and mind that will alert him. When he falls into sin, he will know that it is wrong. No to worry about it, okay? But he can recover. He can and will repent and restore his fellowship with God and people. Sin will make us feel uncomfortable, but Jesus will defend us, comfort us, and protect us. Satan cannot touch us because Satan is a defeated enemy. Satan cannot tempt a true Christian to commit sin and then condemn him to eternal death because Jesus has paid the price for sin and he will be the judge as well. And he will also be the defense lawyer or the believers and will forgive them because they believe that his blood cleanses all their sins. Remember what we learned last Sunday? There's sin that leads not to death and sin that leads to death. Every sin can be forgiven. Only the sins of rejecting Jesus cannot be forgiven because it leads to eternal death. Without Jesus, we have no antidote for sin and we have no lawyer to defend us. Therefore, a true Christian knows for certain that he is set apart from those who persisted in living a sinful lifestyle. Let me take this opportunity to, to address the matter of LGBTQ. If a gay man visits our church, we will welcome him. If he believes and receives Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord, we will baptize him. If he marries a person of the opposite sex, praise the Lord. If not, he should remain single. God will not approve if he wants to have sex with another man because it is against the law of God. It is going against the will and the purpose of God. We must come to church to find a savior, not an endorser of our lifestyle. Therefore, in life, a true Christian is God-fearing instead of sin-loving. A true Christian will obey his Savior, not his sin. 
a true Christian will be assured that God will give him the strength needed to persevere. So what do we need to persevere against sins in a practical terms? Fellowship with Christians. Have you been, are you been doing this? Or your friends that you fellowship are all only your office uh, colleagues, schoolmate, or other friends. Don't fight the battles alone. Don't be a lone ranger Christian. Every Christian faces the same challenge, whether you are gay or straight. Come together to find comfort and encouragement with one another. That is how you can persevere. Remind one another what Christ had done for us on the cross. It's a done deal. Sin will not touch you. As we persevere in obeying Christ, we must also know for certain that we are set apart to love our God, not the world. Verse 19, John says, we know that we are from God. We are children of God. And the world, and the whole world, he used the word, whole world, lies in the power of the evil one. John is saying we are children of God and the world around us is under the control of the evil one, indicating that we are saved in God. But, there are danger out there. There are two opposing kingdoms, the kingdom of and the kingdom of Satan. So in truth, we know that God rules his kingdom with love. Remember, we see in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, John says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Satan, on the other hand, rules his kingdom with lies. John wrote in his Gospel, chapter 8, verse 44, he referred to Satan is a liar. Satan is a liar and the father of lies. Again, in truth, we know that God offers eternal life through Jesus Christ. Satan offers the temporal world. That is why John says in chapter 2, don't love the world. Don't love what the world is offering you because they are temporal. They are passing away and it will end up nothing. But Satan can trick people to believe that the world is our eternity. As we can see how people are pursuing wealth and health instead of pursuing God. Doing all kinds of evil without any fear for the judgment of God. Therefore, in life, a true Christian is a God-loving person. A God-loving person will also be a people loving person why because john tells us in chapter 4 that we love listen because god first loved us therefore the life of a true christian will not be controlled by the world but empowered by god's love to love the people in his life his family his wife his husband his marriage his friends his colleagues a true Christian is defined by Christ, not by worldly possessions or vocations. In other words, a true Christian will not allow the things in the world to have control over him. Now listen to what Paul, Apostle Paul declares. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, he said, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Very clear. All things are lawful for me, but I will not 
be dominated by anything. A true Christian will need money. I serve here as a pastor. I also need money. This is my full-time job. <laughs> but money will not replace God because a true Christian's happiness is not found in the money, but in God. So what do we do in order to love God and not money? I suggest to you, live simply and simply live. Be contented. Life, live as if we have nothing. Listen, live with the things that we have, but leave it as we have nothing, so that the world will not have power over us. What is still controlling your life? Follow the example of Paul who says, I know how to be brought low. And I know, see, you know, I know, I know, I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned, past then, the secret of facing plenty and hungry, abundance and in need. I can do all things through Him, refer to Jesus Christ, who strengthens me. Learn to depend on God for provision for all the worldly things. COVID-19 shows us that many things in life are non-essentials, right? Many places all closed. Huh? Why? What is the reason you close those places? Non-essential. Hospital is essential. We need very little life to survive. Many things are good to have. Maybe we want to have it to show off. A true Christian will let Christ be the reason for his joy. Not the things in the world. So, so far, we have come to know for sure that Christ set us free from the curse of sin and we should obey Christ instead of obeying our sins and keep on sinning and as we persevere on we also know for certain that we are set apart to love God love the God who loved us first so that so we must not be tempted to fall in love with the world which is perishing so well and good, but there is still one more thing that we know for certain as a true Christian. That is, we are set apart to know and to worship the true and living God. Verse 20, John says, And we know that the Son of God, refer, refers to Jesus Christ, has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him refer to god the father who is true and we are in him who is true in him meanings in union and his son jesus christ he is true god and eternal life now here we see john outlines for us our union with the true and living god through his beloved son jesus christ paul tells us in our responsive reading in verse 15 that he jesus is the image of the invisible god god is a spirit we cannot see him with our naked eyes but with the appearance of jesus christ the god incarnate and his life and his ministry on earth and his death on the cross we are given the understanding by the Holy Spirit that God is indeed 
a true and living God. And we are in union with God the Father and God the Son. That's what John says here. So a true Christian is assured of the truth that he is in union of the triune God. He is a permanent member of God's family. So in truth, the Holy Spirit worked in the life of the true believer, a true Christian and caused him to understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, sent by God the Father to save him from his sin. And he is born into the family of God. And in union with the Father who loved and the Son who sacrificed and to enjoy the spiritual blessings thereafter or that follows. Not just eternal life as we talk about blessing as a true Christian, but also the fruits of the Holy Spirit. For example, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. A true Christian knows for certain that the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the true God and all else are false. He knows for certain that he is the redeemed. He is saved and transformed to testify all the goodness of God. As what Paul says in the responsive reading, verses 21 and 22, and you, Paul say, we have read just now, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, rebels, doing evil deeds, he has now, referring to Jesus, reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, refer to God. So true Christians are people who were evil and hostile towards God. They are the rebels redeemed and reconciled to God. They, they become holy, blameless, beyond reproach before God as a result of what? Of Christ's death on the cross. So in life, a true Christian is a gatekeeper of gospel truth and godly living. Having the insight of God's truth, able to discern what is true and what is false and do the right thing. A true Christian will pour out his heart in worship of the true God who created him, redeemed him, live in him and satisfy all his needs. Now, because of this wonderful and loving union with God, John warned us in verse 21 to keep ourselves from idol. So John, as a loving mother, he wants to make it clear to the children of God that they must not let anything, listen, they must not let anything to take God's place in their heart. So in truth, we know that idols are things that take our eyes off God. Idols refer to false gods in the world, offered by Satan to replace the true God. Remember how Satan tempted Jesus? Let's take a look. In Matthew chapter 4, Again, the devil took him, Jesus, to a very high mountain, He's referring to temptation of Jesus, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, all this I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. <laughs> what did Jesus say? Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. So in life, we know that idols are everywhere. But the biggest idol, do you know which is the biggest idol? The biggest idol is the pride of life hidden in your heart and in my heart.
They say the enemy inside is more dangerous than the enemy outside. You see, in our sinful nature, we have this strong desire to pride ourselves as better than others. Don't care who's a person. I am better. I must win. We do things to serve and please ourselves. We want to look good and we can't help but compare. The rich will despise the poor and the poor will envy the rich. Pride of life is causing so much pain and suffering in this world. In the midst of the pain and suffering, we must look to Christ, our Redeemer, and have a quiet confidence in Him. Why? Again, refer back to the responsive reading, 19 and 20. For in Him, in Jesus Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. Whatever we cannot reconcile on earth, we can reconcile in the blood of Jesus on the cross. Amen? Dearly beloved, we will continue to struggle on this side of heaven with the evil one. But God will love us. Be assured, God will love us. God will protect us. And finally, God will bring us safely unto himself. We can know for certain that we will end well. Even the world is not. We will end well. If we put our faith in Jesus and follow him, we must do our part to obey God's command and continue to grow in love for God and for other people. Let us be reminded by the motto. By the way, you all know the motto of this church now. Motto, motto. Not the motto, lah, not motto car. M-O-T-T-O, -T -T -O, okay. And this is printed on the bulletin every week that you receive on top. But it's, it, it looks like it is a secret document. Only a few people read. So I declassify. Living, our motto is living the true life by losing the old life. Something have to make room, right? To follow, that's the key word, to follow the author of life, Jesus Christ. We are called, listen carefully, we are called primarily, primarily to follow Jesus and live by his grace. At the end of the day, it is by grace of God that we live and die. And, and in his name, we are glorified. As I recall my life of 70 years on earth, I could see that God is so good to me. He blessed me with many undeserved blessings. He sent one of his children to nag at me for one year until I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. He forgave my sins, made me a child of God. He gave me the Holy Spirit to guide me in life and in ministry. He gave me the opportunity to experience all kinds of people and situations. The good, the bad, the beautiful and the ugly. But what a really of great concern in life, listen carefully. What really of great concern in life for me and my offspring is what lies beyond this life on earth? Don't you think the same? And I thank God for inspiring Apostle John to write this letter, 1 John, because in reading it, I can know for sure that I live secure 
in the triune God who protect me from condemnations and prepare me for glorification. So a takeaway for me from 1 John is this. As a child of God, I have the assurance that when my eyes are closed, and my heart is stopped. I will be in the presence of God. As Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, thank God, Otherwise, that you'll be exclusively for Apostle Paul. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Jesus, come quickly. Ah. We are need to see face to face with his Savior. That is my only hope and certainty in Christ. And it is also my hope for all the people in my family and all the people in this church. Therefore, as we close the book of 1 John, let us do three things. Three hours. If you are not yet a Christian, receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord now. Take the step of faith because it will open up for you to enjoy all the blessings of God. All the promises are yours by surrendering, by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Now, if you are a Christian, remember, remember your encounter with Jesus. Some of us may have forgotten. Write your conversion testimony one more time. And recall what you learned from 1 John and thank God. And be assured that you are a child of God. Finally, read the Bible. Make it your daily routine. Part and parcel, drinking coffee. I think some of us must have a cup of coffee before you go to work. Let's have some passages of scripture that you read. Our preacher has given you a very good formula, right? 10 minutes after reading, pray. Then after that, continue to see how God worked out your life for the day and at the end of the day, Go back again and thank God and see how the word of God has impacted your life. Know the Bible well and you will be able to differentiate what is true and what is false. And therefore you know for certain that you are indeed in Christ. So before we partake the Lord's Supper, let us pause and reflect. How well are you doing in obeying Christ, loving God and worshipping Him? Just pause for a moment and ask God to help you to do better. Yeah, life is like that. We always work in progress, but we want. Tell God that you have this desire. Please help me to do better. I want to obey Christ. I may not have for some time. I want to love God. I love God will be loving people. I may not have been doing for some time. My worship, well, not so good. Can you please help me to do that?
All right. This is the time that we as Christians were baptized to partake this uh, Lord's Supper. I'd like to request uh, the two elders to come forward to help us to distribute uh, the two in one. We are still in the two in one era. So I'd like to request those who are partaking this uh, Lord's Supper that uh, to rise so that uh, the elders can distribute. 